Okie doke. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna start with the PowerPoint to welcome you. Let's go right here. All right, um, and then we're gonna get rid of that annotate button and open this big. So this is my new branding. <laughs> I'm networking with a lot of dyslexic professionals and they are so brilliant. So I'm putting some of my words backwards, huh. reading from bottom to top. <laughs> If this is what normal reading looks like for you or your child, I can help. <laughs> I mean, you look at it and it's okay. You don't realize how backwards it is, right? So I wanna welcome you. I'm Dr. Marianne Cintron. I've been an educator for 21 years and a classroom teacher for 10. I'm president of Step-by-Step -Step Dyslexia Solutions, which is a 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization. I'm an international speaker and teacher trainer. I'm an app developer. I received my doctorate in ed leadership and administration, and I have two master's degrees, two credentials. Um, and I wonder for such a time as this, I believe I was created because we're having such a a mess in education right now, and so the kids are in such need. I want to introduce you to my family, first of all. My husband and I have been married for 31 years, and we have three adult kids. Richard is 29, Laura is 27, just got married last year, and Randy's in his early 40s. So we're a blended family, Laura's a blended family, so I have a grandson and I'm so young to have a grandson. <laughs> All my peers are having grandkids and retiring and I'm just getting started. And so um, then I have a grand doggy, grand puppy. So I wanna welcome you. I wanna share a little bit about my story. Education, teaching is my third career. My mom always thought I would be a nun or a teacher and I didn't wanna be either. But when I went to college, I really enjoyed creative writing, but I didn't do anything with that uh, liberal arts degree, except I went into retail and I became a department manager in their training program at Bullock's, if you remember that back in the day. And then after several years, maybe eight years later, I went into a different career field at General Dynamics. And using my English degree as a technical writer, I thought I was right in the category. I didn't know what to do with my English degree. And then it wasn't until I had got married and had kids and I was a room mom when my kids were in kinder and first grade that I learned about teaching and how valuable it was. I saw how strategically their teachers taught phonics, reading and writing and spelling. And I knew if their teachers hadn't been trained properly, they could set the kids on a wrong trajectory. And I started um, some of my credentialing, my credentialing programs and man, it was a lot of work and was very strategic. So I didn't become compassionate to helping dyslexic children until I was earning my second master's degree. And one of my professors at Azusa Pacific here in California recommended I join the International Dyslexia Association and now I'm a board member in that branch here in California. And in my own studies, I learned about music and its value to help kids reading. And it never occurred to me that the science of reading or you know, all the Orton-Gillingham curriculum, it never, never occurred to me that music was so out of the box thinking and it would really have people questioning what's the value of music. But I saw kids start making rapid increases with it and there we go, is my journey. I, I've been using music ever since when I work with kids to read. So I'm gonna change the cover of my book. And I'm gonna say, I used to say this 12 years ago, dyslexia is not a four letter word because everybody's afraid to say it. And when they're afraid to say it, they don't wanna tackle it. They don't wanna look into it and see what they can do to help 20% of our population 
who has it. And now I'm in some networks that have brilliant dyslexic people in them. And I'm, I, you know, I've always known about Henry Ford and Albert Einstein, um, Steve Jobs and Leonardo da Vinci and Walt Disney, but you never think about the peers. Who, who are you hanging around with that are dyslexic people? Now, my mom always thought, told me that an entrepreneur was someone who was unemployed. And that can really break your heart if you happen to be an, an entrepreneur, um, not thinking that there's all these geniuses who are entrepreneurs. And the reason was my dad was in and out of work. He had a lot of health issues, being diabetic, and he eventually went blind. But she never saw him achieve his dreams. And he had big dreams. And when he got really ill, she actually had to go work at General Dynamics or Lockheed. She worked at Lockheed. So that was that stable career. She was there 20 years, steady income, steady hours. But that's not for everybody. And so what I want to share is that um, 40%, uh, yeah, the statistics say 40% of self-made millionaires are dyslexic people. And I wanna start off by talking about Jillian Lynn. She was a little wiggly bottom when she was in, in school in the 1930s. And her mom didn't know what to do with her and her teacher said she's just so wiggly. Her mom took her to the doctors and are you familiar with Jillian Lynn by any chance? No. Her mom took her to the doctors and the doctor put her in a big room and turned on the music. And she started dancing. And he said, that's the thing, she's a dancer. She doesn't belong in that chair. And that is how our classroom is structured. Sit and be quiet and do the work. Copy from the board, work with one person. And Jillian Lynn, you'll be surprised to know, was the choreographer for Cats and for Phantom of the Opera. And she won a beautiful award, uh, the Grammys, and um, she actually passed away two years ago in her, 90, in her 90s. She was 92 years old. But if you ever watch any of her videos, you'll see how amazing she was teaching and then winning her own awards. So 40% of self-made millionaires are dyslexic. We know that the actors and actresses and athletes are millionaires, but look at these self-made millionaires, Erin Brockovich. I don't have a lot of women that I put up, but there are women <laughs> that are dyslexic that are wonderful. So I, now I wanna talk about unlocking the brilliance of the dyslexic mind. In the past, I've spoken so much about the school to prison pipeline and with the problems of teachers not being trained. But you know what? I am taking a 180 degree turn on this. And I wanna talk about the dyslexic people. 35% of all entrepreneurs are dyslexics. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm not dyslexic, but 35% are. And they, are, they excel in these four areas, the arts, engineering, um, architecture, and of course, entre being entrepreneurs. So Winston Churchill, Leonardo da Vinci, Alexander Graham Bell, Henry Ford and Einstein, um, geniuses that really impacted the world. So the problem is in the industrial revolution, the printing press came to us in the industrial revolution and immediately we lost 20% of our population. We don't think of that very much, but people who were inventors and artists and architects, suddenly when reading was a requirement and they couldn't read, they started feeling a, they had a shroud of shame. And so 20% of our people, because they were dyslexic. Now we had an apprentice model where people learned with hands-on, they observed, and that's how they were successful. And suddenly we have our state standards and we have to follow a, a model of what learning looks like. So I always have to give the formal definition of dyslexia, that it's a learning disability, neurological in origin. And it's characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. And I state it more easily 
that it's neurological in origin. So the brain can be retrained and it's more of a learning difference than a learning disability. And it affects the students reading, writing and speaking. Now, what I wanna do is talk about the creativity um, opportunities, prisms and the success of dyslexic people. So we talk about creativity. When I became a teacher, everything I was learning in the credential programs, I just couldn't do all that in the classroom because we had all these rigorous benchmarks and standards. And I felt creativity was really stifled. And I know a lot of teachers do. What about the kids? Are the kids' creativity being stifled? We're starting to see more of that come back. But if you look at the scores down here, the, the scores have been dropping in our states for the past 30 years. So um, proficiency is considered a C minus. Two thirds of the kids are not even earning C minuses in reading. And this is the national, the report card by the National Association of Educational Progress. So we need to address our reading crisis. And my challenge now is for parents be recognizing the giftings that your children have. And while they're not all meant to go to college, if they desire to go to college, that is an option for them. And there's a way we can prepare them for college and for careers that require degrees. Cruz, it was a second grader who didn't even know his letter names and sounds last year. We taught him his letter names and sounds, got him reading, uh, you know, in my reading program. So now he's in third grade. He exited special ed for English, and he's actually reading at a fourth grade level and a third grade, uh, a fifth grade comprehension. So I have a simulation here, and I'm glad you have your paper. I want you to look at this sentence and see if you could read it. You want to give it a try or you want to? The, uh, the, the stale marshmallow is in the yellow bowl. Excellent. And you got it right. So what did we do? We removed the second vowel, right? And just to bring closure, <laughs> I'll let you see that second vowel in there. And then um, let's try another one. Try to read this one. Oops. No, that's okay. You could read that. The snowstorm is hard on the old fellow. Yeah, so a reading brain can actually read that. But this is what some of the words look like to dyslexic people. And again, we remove the second letter. And that's what it should look like. So sometimes we're reading the writing of dyslexic kids. We, we can figure it out. Even though they've omitted letters, they've omitted syllables, teachers or people who have looked at it can figure it out. How about this one? Small world after all. Hey, and it moved by itself. You're right. So here it is, closure to that one. But a lot of the kids are writing the wrong way. They're omitting letters and syllables. So give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Fourth graders in Los Angeles are reading better than the national average. Thumbs down. You are correct. So in California, we have some of the lowest reading scores in the nation. And in Los Angeles, we have some of the lowest scores in the state. 66% of students fail to reach grade level reading by fourth grade and they rarely catch up. And those kids who drop out of high school, 35% of them are dyslexics. Here's another simulation. See if you can figure this out and what we do. comes a dime when the turtle crawls away. Excellent. <laughs> there comes a time when a turtle crawls away. Did you ever own a turtle? Yes. Weren't they fun? <laughs> Not fun, fun, but amazing. There's such, yes. Yeah, so this is what it would look like. And again, the letters, the letters are omitted when a dyslexic person writes. What about this one? Kitty come from? 
Okay. What what do we do here? Ignored it. <laughs> What's you know what the trick is? If that's another level, isn't it? So your brain told you what it was. So we changed every E to an I. So your brain. I was wrong. I said kitty. It was kite. I can't. I was, I made oh, okay. Where did the cute kite come from? So we changed every E to an I. And I tried to use vowel consonant E words. So let me show you some of the writing that I get because I do an assessment for dyslexic kids. This is, these are four different students. See if you could figure out what this sentence should have been. The clam stayed on the bottom of the ocean. Okay. So they spell it all different ways, right? This was a sentence that I dictated. Okay. So here's another, so I give them five sentences. Here's number two. See if you could figure this one out. We gathered in a circle around the campfire and told ghost stories. Good. Okay, so look how they, how they spell pretty much the same, right? Some differences. This one is we gathered in a circle around the campfire and told ghost stories. Okay, here's number three. They rushed into the cottage in the nick of time. There you go. You guys thought you were going to have it easy and just listen, huh? <laughs> I'm putting you to work. That's right, Christina. They rushed into the cottage in the nick of time. So that's what dyslexia looks like in the classroom. Here's what it looks like in the workplace. Uh, the adults don't know how to spell dollars. They don't know the doubling rule. So one thing I really teach in my reading program are the, the spelling rules, the grammar rules. So the O st stands for opportunities. Not all children have to go to college. Um, college was right for me. But unless you need to earn a degree that requires college, there's trade school. And I want to just show that Christina here on this webinar today, she is someone who has always loved pets and she wants to be a veterinarian. So Christina actually graduated from University of Davis and she's dyslexic and she advocates for, advocates for dyslexic kids. And she's competing for the title of Miss California this year. And there's her picture right here. She's the tall brunette with the fuchsia dress. And she's she um, won the Miss Yosemite Valley title. And we're so proud of you, Christina. Yay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marianne. That really means a lot to me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you were on. Gorgeous. <laughs> I didn't know you were on. Thank you. <laughs> uh, she's, she's getting putting her pretty face on because she works at a um, where do you work with a vet veterinary, right? Yeah, so currently I'm working at the UC Davis Veterinary Hospital in emergency and critical care. So I'm prepping to go to work right now. Like I'm getting my lunch together. I'm like doing the last couple of chores. Like I got to walk my dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we want to support her in her journey. When, can I ask a question? When's the, um, you know, when will I be able to watch you on television? You actually can. So the competition is June 21st through the 25th, and it's going to be live streamed on YouTube. What day did you say? June 21st through the 25th. Sorry, Marianne. No, I want to, I'm glad you said that because this is going to get out to a lot of people and everybody listening and watching this YouTube, this video, you need to um, support Christina. <laughs> How do I just go to YouTube and hit Miss America? Miss, is it Miss America co contest? It'll be Miss California, Miss California. And we'll be doing a lot of advertisements. I'll definitely uh, send some more information to Marianne after this. And um, when it gets closer to June, we'll uh, broadcast it a little bit more. I didn't know you were on, so I was saying how gorgeous you are. So continue. <laughs> In June, thank you. Around the corner. Now, Christine, I know. Christina's on my board. We're very blessed to have her on the board. I just lost my PowerPoint. I'm really grateful to be on the board. It's such a great opportunity to reach out 
to so many different individuals. It's a good platform. Okay, so what I want to share about opportunities is we, if we understand the brain, did I put it? Okay, so let me, understanding the brain, the left side of the brain is logic, language, reasoning, math and science, and it controls the right side. The right side of the brain, creativity, imagination, intuition, and music awareness. So my program really is unique because we are utilizing the research um, the research information from Dr. Roger Sperry, back in the early 1960s, he did the uh, split brain theory and he severed the central part of the brain called the corpus callosum. And he worked at the left and the right sides of the brain independently. And the seizures stopped from these patients, but they could still grow and learn and develop. And he challenged educators if they would ever use this information in the classroom we could help kids with their reading. Now it used to be called word blindedness in the early 1960s. And then the Orton Gillingham, their organization spawned into the International Dyslexia Association. So what we do is we have music in an earphone that plays in the left ear and it crosses to the right side of the brain, giving that side of the brain a job it likes to do. So it won't take over the reading which is happening in the dyslexic brain. And then we listen to it when they read, they listen to it when they work in their workbook, and they listen to it in my app, Duncan Dyslexia, that plays spelling exercises in the right ear. So the spelling exercises are going to the left angular gyrus, the music goes to the right angular gyrus, and it strengthens the brain like Pilates of the brain. And pretty soon I'm gonna have a neuroscientist help me with brain scans of kids reading with music because it's real hard for people to understand that it really works. And Roger Sperry won a Nobel Prize for his findings in the 1980s. So shouldn't we use some of his science in our practice of teaching reading? My goodness. And no one else is doing anything with music like me. So here's another uh, and something we teach in our program that needs to be taught explicitly to all students, but, you know, and the multisensory approach is very helpful and everybody will learn with the multisensory approach, but dyslexic children need this. So if this isn't being done, this is why they're going from one low reading group to the lower reading group to the lowest reading group. And this happened to a friend of mine who said, he finally was given a new test and he shot into the highest reading group because he is a genius. But in reading, it just wasn't showing because he wasn't being taught the correct way. So I'm gonna ask you to look at the words two, two, and two. They're homophones. They're spelled three different ways and used three different ways. So if you look at T-O, we use this in the infinitive form, like to eat, to smile, to go. And it's also used as if you're going somewhere. I'm going to the store. I'm going to school. So I would highlight T-O in yellow, and I would highlight what it does, what, how you use it also in yellow. And then I would look at T-W-O, highlighted a different color, TWO is used for the number two or to tell time or measurement. So that's math, you know, that's all those different ways we use it in math, right? And then TOO, I would highlight a different color. So I have it in red. And this means too much, too heavy, or also. So these are different ways we can explain to them, explain to the students how we teach the word two. And here is an example. What I would have them in our workbook, I would explicitly work with the students. So we're gonna say two in all these sentences. I want them to tell me which one to pick and I'll have the definition side by side. So they went to the corner store. And um, Deb, what would you put, which one would you put in there? Yeah. Yep. So they went to the corner store to get two candy bars. 
What would you put in front of two and in, in front of get? T-O. T-O. That would be the infinitive. And then in front of candy bars. T-W-O. T-W-O. Good. And so you notice when you have a number, you're going to have a noun that's going to follow it. That's a little trick that's going to show you. And if you have um, a verb like get, you're going to want to use the infinitive T-O. So there's little tricks like that to teach the kids how to use the different words too. We like to teach them explicitly the difference between are and our. Let me hold on one second here. I'm going to um, stop my recording.